So how often do we quiet ourselves down and, mm-hmm. and start to pray, either standing in church or at home in front of our icons or privately or publicly? And we've got <coughs> movies going through our mind. We've got got all the, the list of, of things that we need to do today. And then then there is that, that so-and-so who is who is really bugging me at, at the office and I really want to strangle him and on and on and on and on. Um, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and part of that, of course, um, is about resentments, um, especially uh, regarding that, uh, that so-and-so at the office who is, uh, who is ruining our life, or at least our plans, or whatever. Um, and so, and so we build up this, this anger. We we take a we essentially take a snapshot of them. We create a conceptual image of them, and we start thinking negatively about them. And we and we build up this whole idea about that person, and it turns into a resentment. It turn, turns into a kind of like a a tumor in the soul that's putting out um, metastases of anger and bitterness and sadness and 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 hatred and slander and all these other things which are which really make our life which really spoil our life um so that we can't even um, how often how often it is that we we can't quiet ourselves down i mean one of the reasons that in our society, we have music playing everywhere. We have TVs going off everywhere. We have um, constant um, distraction uh, coming coming forth from some device or another. Um, is that we have trouble being quiet? But being quiet is the is one of the most important things in the spiritual life that we can do. And that's why the fir- the, the third principle of the spiritual life, uh, do not react, do not resent, keep inner stillness. If you want to use the Greek word, it's Hezekiah. Just so you know, it's not some new age thing, I'll use the Greek terms. and It's old age. Um, old age spirituality. Hezekiah means stillness. And stillness is not only a goal of the spiritual life, but it's one of the fundamental operative principles of that enables us to maintain stability, that maintains us to helps us maintain sobriety, that enables us to uh, uh, keep our keep our, our wits about us and our and a rational um, response to the world. Uh, Hezekiah. Uh, stillness is the thing that enables us to not react. It enables us to to uh, let go of the resentments. And the path to Hezekiah and the uh, the practice of Hezekiah, um, which is, by the way, is not at all complicated. I'll, we'll talk about it. Um, but it's not at all complicated. But it's a means of of bringing peace to our life, and how and for how many of us do we uh, do we wish we had greater inner peace? Um, when I was last time I was at St. Anthony's in in Arizona at the at the monastery, um, Elder uh, uh, Pisius came and um, we sat having coffee at four o'clock in the morning after the um, after the liturgy, and um, he was incredibly generous with his time with me. But as we, uh, as I was, we were sitting there and just talking about kind of monast- monastic kind of business, I noticed that his peace, the peace emanated from him. A remarkable peace. A holy peace. Not just stillness, not just silence, not just, but, but something that that became, um, 
a means of entrance into prayer, a means of entrance into uh, into a deeper and deeper experience of God. <coughs> because ultimately, what is what is that holy peace? But uh, the experience of God, the presence of God. Um, and when you have uh, and when you have somebody who is attained to that level of spiritual maturity where they have become um, a locus of that presence um, and can and can share that peace and there that's that's one of that's one of the that's one of the great marks of of an authentic spiritual authentically spiritual man of a holy man um, in other words of the kind of spiritual maturity um, that we can hope for and strive for often gets translated stillness or silence uh, and it is both well, there's a difference silence of course um, not speaking but also um, uh, there's a silence that's a deeper inner stillness than just not speaking there's, there's a silence that is a um, and a, and a stillness that is a participation in God's presence. And the cultivation of the awareness of the presence of God is a foundational aspect of, of Orthodox spirituality. The fathers talk about it. St. Isaac the Syrian talks about it at great length. And our task really is that cultivation of that aware of the awareness of the presence of God. Now, obviously, to do that, we have to we have to to dispel distraction, right? We have to allow nothing to shake us from that from that focused uh, sobriety, which is that which is the awareness of the presence. So that we don't find ourselves reacting all over the place. Right? You see how see how this is all intertwined? These are all phases of a of the of the spiritual um, the spiritual task. <coughs> now this manifests itself and is the fruit of prayer. And often we think of prayer in terms of asking God for stuff. How often do we have an idea that God is like Santa Claus? And we ask him for stuff and he and he knows who's naughty and nice and he keep you know he keeps track and if you're gonna you know if you're gonna get toys or you're gonna get some coal in your stocking and all of that kind of stuff. Um well, that's not who God is. Um, and it's, I think, very important to understand that the church looks at people and the, the tradition looks at people at their various degrees and levels of maturity. Just like we look at children, a small ch child, 
we have certain uh, knowledge of what that child can, can deal with, what a small child can't deal with, and we don't expose them to it. Then, you know, if they're, a, you know, just a preteen, that's another stage. If they're a teenager, young teenager, that's another stage. If they're an, uh, I love the Russian word for a older teenager, um, an almost grown, <coughs> <coughs> then there's a di different stage than for adults. But then there's a diff there are different stages uh, for adults as well. You know, uh, a 25 year old is, you, you're not gonna look for, for a 25 year old for wisdom. 50 maybe, more likely 70 and up. Um, and it's, it's the, uh, and the church's teaching is actually geared to people in various stages of maturity. Um, you know, being uh, uh, Anglo-Saxons, and being, that is being of Indo-European stock, or our culture is entirely Indo-European, um, uh, we think in terms of, of threes, you know, we, uh, of triads. And so, um, uh, so for example, uh, one, of, one, of the, one of those is, uh, that, that deals with this is that um, the, the most immature, spiritually immature, um, is going to think in terms of a very concrete kinds of ideas. Um, and so, for example, on that level, the uh, uh, concept of God is either like Santa Claus or even, or very likely, that a person is afraid of a, of being punished. And that God is, God is the great disciplinarian in the sky who's, who's going to punish you, punish you if you're bad. And in, in, a, in a slightly more, slight, barely slightly more sophisticated version of that is that if you're not good, you're going to go to hell. And so it's all about fear of hell. And the fear of God is fear of fear, fear of, of, of of punishment, but even, but but in a sense, it's not even uh, it's it's not even about the fear of God as much as it's fear of hell. Um, and that's that's really a great uh, it's a great distortion. On the other hand, it's where people start out very often. Um, so. The next type of the fear of God, um, the next level of spiritual maturity, um, is that of an employee. The first, the first is a slave, fearing only punishment. And the second is an employee, where you fear your boss because you're afraid you're not going to get paid. What's, what's due you? And it's a very, you know, and, and, our entire society operates, you know, on this employee kind of system. We don't have so much in the way of slaves, and, and our bosses really aren't going to punish us like the slaves were punished in the past. You know, they're not going to come after us with whips and, and, um, and, and chains, but they're going to come after us according to our salaries and according to our uh, privileges and things like that. Um, and so, and so, that gets projected on God. And so we fear God out of fear of not getting what's due us. What we think, what I think is due me. What my, um, what my reward should be. And then there's, then there's the third level. And the third level of the fear of God is the fear of a son. And the fear of the son is not about fear of getting punished. It's not about fear of losing what, what's coming to him. It's about fear of offending the love of the father. Now think about the different types of relationships with God that there, there are in, these, in this, this threefold model. 
on the, on the lowest level of that of a that of a slave, where um, you fear God because you because you're afraid He's going to send you to hell. There's no personal relationship there, right? There's no relationship there. It's just you know it's just a cowed relation. And any more than there's really a personal relationship between a slave and their master. <coughs> For the employee, there may be a personal relationship there, but uh, still, the whole the whole it's not. But it's not a relationship of love. And usually, it's a and you, and how often is it a relationship of mistrust, and not and not expecting that the that the boss is going to give you what's coming to you. But the relationship of the son is a relationship of love. And so the son fears to offend the father. And he fears the deprivation of the love of the father. The church teaches about God and it teaches in relation uh, in relation to, you know, similar categories as these <clears throat> on a um, on the most basic level you know the kind of the Sunday school level um, uh, I don't think we generally talk about God sending people to hell unless unless you're in a Calvinist church and things like that um, uh, or some of the other um, some of the other sects that that are really into uh, uh, fire and brimstone and trying to inspire people to uh, usually to pay more so that uh, so that the pastor can live he, he can have he can have leather seats in that pink Cadillac um, which of course is well anyway uh, but what kind of um, what kind of an image of God is that What kind of image of God is is inculcated in the people? You know, a harsh judge, not a loving father, not a generous father, not a forgiving father. Whereas on the opposite end, for those who have attained to a, to a higher degree of uh, uh, spiritual maturity and have attained, have entered into a relationship of, of loving communion with God. It's an entirely different understanding of who God is and an entirely different experience of who God is. Um, the theology of the church, the teachings of the church, not the theology, the teaching of the church reflects this. Um, <clears throat> We have teaching. We have teaching for children. We have teaching for, um, for those, you know, kind of uh, who are a little bit more intellectually mature. And then we have, then we have the teachings for the mature. Um, and none of this is esoteric, and none of this is, but it's, uh, but it's geared towards people who have a certain kind of experience of God, a certain kind of relationship with God. If all you're doing is expecting stuff from God and all of your prayer is about asking God for stuff, right? What kind of relationship is there really? Um, but if what your prayer is, is a desire for deeper communion with, with, with God, to experience union with God, to experience um, what it means to to be an adopted son of God, then it's a whole different experience. So prayer differs. Now in the public life of the church, you find all of this somewhat mixed together. And in a lot of the public prayers of the church, 
um, you have material, especially scriptural material, and our ser our services are what seventy percent scriptural material, especially the daily cycle, matins and vespers, and and the hours and all of that. It's mostly psalms. Um, this the psalms have material that everyone can can identify with. Whatever whatever level you find yourself. But then you have a lot of the stakira, you have the, you have the, uh, uh, the teaching material, uh, and you have some of the devotional material, um, and, and, and these other uh, parts of the public worship of the church, which are uh, which are which are aimed, and you have to look. You have to analyze the material. Some at some at one level, some at another. Um, and a lot of it is uh, is what what people will uh, re what resonates with people. Now, does this make sense to you? Okay. All right. A lot of the material that I'm presenting tonight is at the highest level, okay? Because it's focused on awareness of the presence of God. It's focused on the experience of communion with, with the Father in the Son by the Spirit as an adopted, uh, a, through our adoption to sonship by Christ through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, how does uh, apathia re relate to silence and st stillness? This is the state of apathia. Okay. So it's basically the same concept st with different words. Yeah. It's just a different aspect of it. Um, ap apathia mean is essentially um, non-reaction. <clears throat> there are... It, again, from what little I know, some parallels between what you're describing and what Buddhists try to do with uh, emptying their minds and koans and things like that to shut off the rational brain. Mm -hmm. But they have no presence of God no. to be invited in. And that's the difference, the radical difference. So the, 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 the methodology, the means, are somewhat similar, but the end is completely different. The form is very similar, but the content is different. Mm -hmm. Um, now I have a theory that um, a that a lot of Buddhism was significantly uh, influenced by a vagrant Christianity, because that was that was the spirituality of the Syriac missionaries who, by the seventh century, had made it all the way to the Pacific, and and it was and and uh, it was this this great kind of religious marketplace. <coughs> you know, they were you had, mostly Nestorians, weren't they? Or? Well, yeah, they yeah. were Syriac Christians. Mm -hmm. um, Nestor, I mean, they weren't Nestorian per se, but they were um, they were Syriac Christians who followed the, the Antiochian tradition. Oh. Um, it's only later, it's a that's a political label. Mm -hmm. um, and and quite frankly, they didn't they didn't necessarily embrace what Nestorius had to say at all. Um, it also wasn't very politically correct to be part of the part of the Church of the Roman Empire when you were a citizen of the Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe you find it an interesting contribution to your theory, but uh, there actually is a. A temple complex in Bamiyan, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. in which there used to be all these statues of Buddhas prior to being blown up by the Taliban and thing. Yes, in 2001. Yeah, one of those statues was actually a Galatian. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe. Oh, there's a there's a lot to it, yeah. and and you um, you also see a lot of similarities in. Um, well, Sufism is basically 
um, it's Christianity without the name of Jesus or without it's, it's a kind of Aryan version of Christianity um, and uh, um, and a lot of their religious philosophy comes from the same sources as this the sources of, of, of this whole approach um, I really go back to origin and Evagrius who was a disciple of of the Cappadocian fathers he was um, he was ordained by Saint Basil the Great and he was a, a, a subdeacon or a deacon in the in the in Hagia Sophia under Gregory of Nazianzen and I believe he also had a relationship with Saint John Chrysostom um, before he ended up going to Palestine um, and he was, he was the great intellectual foundation um, for uh, educated monasticism. And he developed a lot of, the, of, of these basic concepts, which then got integrated um, by all the fathers, uh, Greek, Latin, and Syriac, um, and Southern, um, and uh, which became the foundation of uh, uh, Orthodox uh, spiritual theology. Um, you know, most of it purged of, uh, uh, well, all of it really purged of the heretical and, and really weird stuff that uh, Evagrius had in there. So, yeah. Would you say that the slave relationship in a kind of current worldview would be something similar to what a soldier experiences in the military? Mm -hmm. So in the case of the employee, right, he's just afraid of his paycheck being lost. Mm -hmm. But in the case of a soldier, he's afraid of court martial imprisonment, um, you know, punishments of every kind of sort that an employee would never experience. Right. But a slave would. Exactly. So it's probably the difference between an enlisted man, an officer, and a general. So. Officers get away with a lot more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Generals get away. Um, okay. Um, so anyway, let's let's move to this. Um, There are different types of prayer. Um, there's public prayer, um, you know, the sacraments of the church, the services of the church, but there are also uh, public, um, various other kinds of public prayers, you know, um, the devotional material like akathis and canons and, and things like that. Um, and the church always uses a text for public prayer. Um, we never, almost never in the Orthodox tradition do we use spontaneous personal prayer um, in, in, a public, in a public setting. And this can be with two or three people or it can be with thousands. Um, it's usually uh, always based on a text. And that's so that everybody can pray together with one mind. Um, and, you know, as going back to the Lord saying, when two or three agree together in my name, I will grant their requests, right? Um, so there's, there's public prayer. Then there's private prayer. And private prayer is a lot of what I um, want to focus on um, because it's through developing our private prayers, our, our own personal prayer life, that we build up the foundations um, that enable us to enter into deeper stillness and into, in, into a deeper state of non-reaction. Um, to enable us to, uh, to let go of resentments. And all of this has to, has, takes place primarily in, in private because um, the prayer of repentance is always personal. It's always in private. Um, uh, there are uh, public prayers of, of repentance, right? But, um, but 
ultimately it comes down to what am I repenting of? What are, what are my particular sins? Uh, what, are, what are my shortcomings? What, are the, uh, what ways do I need to change? And what ways do I need to transform my life? Um, so that's, that's always on a personal level. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, the, uh, we also can use in, in personal prayer, we can also use prayer book, you know, various prayer books. We can use other kinds of devotional materials. Uh, and, that, and that's all good. But it's not the, uh, uh, but that's only one level of prayer. Now remember the, remember the, uh, the image or the uh, idea of the soul. You have the rational mind. And you have the news. Rational mind is tied very much with the body because it processes all the data that comes from the senses. The rational mind is basically the brain. Um, and it basically includes also feelings, emotions, sensations, imagination, memories. All of that is in, stored in the brain. And this is the animal part of our soul. It's, it's like it's like other um, created beings. Um, it's the other material creation. What distinguishes us is the noetic part. Um, whereas the rational mind and our body are part of the material creation, um, the rational mind is the spiritual part of the material creation. The noose is of the same nature as the angels. That's why a human soul is a composite being. A human is a composite being. Not just body and soul, but body, soul, and spirit, or noose. Or, um, and it's composite because it's material and it's spiritual. Noetic, angelic. And the noose has the particular function of being able to perceive God and spiritual reality directly, not through the senses. You don't see, you don't see, hear, smell, taste, or touch noetic beings. But you sent, you, you're aware of them. You have a, a, a it's a, it's a, uh, it's a it's a spiritual awareness. Um, of course, as the the rational mind and the noose both have aspects, as does the body, of being the image of God. And this is and this is, this is important. But but the mo the the kind of core of that is the noose. When it comes to prayer, part of what we're part of what we're doing um, is we have there's prayer of the mind. Well, there's oral prayer, and then there's noetic prayer. There's, a, there's also a kind of interim of the mind and the heart. What is that? Is that like... Uh... I'll get there. Sometimes the noose is referred to as the heart. Um, or, the, or, or sometimes a spirit. Oral prayer, in other words, uses words, right? And 
Uh, that's what public prayer is. It's oral prayer. Um, we, we say the words of the services together, right? Or we sing them together. Um, or we, or maybe the priest um, is praying, is praying the words and, and, and everybody enters in. At least people enter in to say the Amen, right? Um, but also there's oral prayer in terms of, of prayer book prayers, right? You read the, you read the prayers very often. You read them aloud. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, and, and, and what, is, what is that doing? It's involving both the body and the mind in prayer. Now that doesn't, yeah. The world would also include the physical aspects of prayer, like prostration, sensing, gestures, all of that stuff. Right. right. Sign of the cross, bows, mm -hmm. Um, all of that. That's all bodily. It, Orals is physical. Right. Yeah. And it's a good thing to get the body involved in prayer. And you go to the Orthodox services and you know the body's involved in prayer because you, because your knees hurt and your feet hurt after the service, right? Um, and um, and if you're sitting in a nice padded Protestant pew or something like that probably doesn't hurt quite as much does does mind occupy kind of a pivotal relationship between oral and noetic in the sense yes. that the mind the brain is tied to the body but it's also tied to the nous. right exactly and the the mind the rational mind holds holds it together mm -hmm. um and is the is the means of expression of the noose but it's also the means of expression of the body. Um, and so, uh, and you can't say that, that um, oral prayer or prayer of the mind is, uh, is of a lower level. It's, it's just a different aspect. Um, so obviously corporate prayer has to be oral prayer. Or physical prayer, um, but when we but when it comes to um, uh, oral prayer, whether it's corporate prayer or whether it's by ourselves, the mind better be involved, right? Otherwise, what are you doing? You're just sitting there reading words and thinking about something else. And how often do we do that? You know, you know, we can get through we can get through uh, all the morning prayers and and not remember if we said half of them, right? Because we were thinking about what do we have to do at work? What do we have to do? At, what do I have to do at, you know, how's, what's the traffic going to be like or whatever? Um, so, so oral and mental prayer um, are very important. And when you're praying with the mind, means you're praying with the understanding. You're praying, and you're praying with the feelings, and you're praying with the emotions, and, you're, um, and to some extent even with the imagination. Uh, because all of those are parts of the mind. Um, and those things can also very easily lead us astray into all sorts of distraction. You know, we can start imagining things and, you know, and trying to picture, you know, if we're pious, you know, trying to picture ourselves, you know, in certain situations and things like that. Well, that's not prayer. That's getting lost in the imagination. Um, <coughs> then there's the next. So, so prayer of the mind basically is when we, pr when we pray silently. And we, we're thinking the prayers. We're thinking the words. We're thinking the concepts. We're 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 um, uh, med meditating on the images. Maybe an external image. Maybe maybe not. Maybe just an internal image, um, or a feeling, or an emotion. But where is that? It's all here. It's in the rational mind. Um, anytime we're using words,
Words and thoughts is mental prayer. So, um, if we've gone, you know, if we've gone beyond the prayer book prayers and our, our, um, or maybe saying our own prayers, or maybe we're we're meditating on the Jesus prayer. Okay, what what is meditation? Meditation is is thinking about concepts, right? They may be religious concepts, but where is that? It's in the rational mind. Is yeah. it at the level of contemplation of the Roman Catholics? Usually think about it where they they imagine wounds of Christ and things of this sort. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, the Roman Catholic language and Orthodox language reverse meditation and contemplation. Yeah. Okay, in our uh, at least in the vocabulary that I'm using, meditation means a rational um, uh, thinking about rationally thinking about concepts, images, the mind, the feeling. It's with the rational mind. Whereas contemplation is the noose. Whereas noose is contemplation. So. Now, prayer of the mind in the heart, or of the of the mind in the noose, is a kind of an interim step towards a, towards a higher level of prayer, towards a noetic level of prayer. Um, <coughs> in other words, our awareness of God has been ignited. Our awareness of God is present, and and yet we're still using we're still using words. So, for example, using the Jesus prayer very often is prayer of the mind and the heart, because we're still using words. And anything, and all words are of the rational mind. So how is the heart engaged? So the heart is engaged because because um, it's an aspect of awareness. It's an aspect of consciousness, and very often we're we're um, oblivious to the noetic level of consciousness. Very often we we have no sense of the presence of God. We have no sense of of spiritual reality. So you could be reciting the Jesus prayer completely mechanically. And that's both oral and in the mind has nothing to do with the news. It has nothing to do with the news. But you can also engage. How do you engage the news when it's saying the Jesus prayer as opposed to just rattling off the words? Uh, and this, I think, this is this is one of this is one of the um, this is one of the one of the main challenges is to how to do that. And the way I can't I can't see how to explain it in words other than to do it. Mm. Um, so it, you could start out with just mind and, and, and physical, but it, it can then the, the, dive the, into yes, and you know, and and usually and usually what happens with it is that you start out with the Jesus prayer, and then you become more and more aware of, of the presence of God, and then the Jesus prayer trails away, and you're simply in the presence of God. In other words. You've made the the transition from meditation to contemplation. Still moving the knots. Maybe still moving the knots, but it'll just be material. It'll just be mechanical. Uh, because ultimately, the the prayer itself drops away, and you enter into 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 stillness. Contemplation, or. Uh, noetic prayer 
is the prayer of stillness. It's beyond words. It's beyond feelings. It's beyond emotions. It's beyond images. It's not about having pious feelings when you look at icons or some other religious picture or something. That's, 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 that's not noetic prayer. It's a, it's a kind of meditation. It's not bad, you know, by any means. But it's, but it's still not, not those higher levels of prayer. And the reason to get towards the higher levels of prayer is because in contemplation, in contemplative prayer, this is where the Holy Spirit is the most active in transforming our consciousness. Because remember, remember, remember what this word means? Be transformed in the renewal of your mind. It's what repentance is. And this gets translated repentance, but, but it means so much more than what repentance means in English. Because what we're talking about in authentic spirituality is the transformation of our consciousness, of our noose. The noose is, one aspect of the noose is consciousness. And the, the fathers talk about um, in some detail about what that transformation is. Um, and that transformation uh, starts off starts off with um, the simple awareness of, of the presence of God. So, like you go into church and you know God is present. You go to the you go to the go to communion and you feel you feel different and God is present. You go to confession and you know that you've received the grace of God and because your sins have been lifted off you. Right? All of that's noetic perception. Okay. Um, we all experience that, right? Do we? Don't we? How do we know? Mm -hmm. Well, you can only know. It's you see, it's it's beyond ra it's beyond rational. Exactly. How do you know if it's beyond rationality? Because it's basically a shared experience. The uh, the non orthodox long ago lost the concept of noose. Mm -hmm. But they all still have a noose. They all can, still have the noose. Can they nonetheless enter into a noetic prayer even though they don't know what a noose yep. is? Every human being has a noose. So not just the non-Orthodox, but even non-Christians. Non-Christians, yeah. Uh, can maybe, despite what their rational concept is, nonetheless but stumble into noetic prayer? Mm -hmm. Their philosophy, basically... Um, Precluded the idea of the news, medieval philosophy, mm -hmm. and of course the Protestants don't have it all. Yeah, and the non-Christians don't have it at all. No, and so and so, and so it's not that they don't that they don't have noetic prayer or they don't have contemplation. They just they don't have the vocabulary to to either teach it or to or to talk about it. How because there are plenty of Protestants that have. Contempl the, well, yeah. Yeah, it practice contemplation. There are plenty of, 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 of Protestants and Catholics that, that, that have a very high level of spiritual awareness, but, but what's lacking is the vocabulary. So they, they're engaged in noetic prayer, they just don't know yes. to call it noetic. What about non-Christians? Yep, same. Even maybe some of those Buddhists who don't think there's a presence, but nonetheless there's a presence. Well, yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, you listen to the Dalai Lama, and basically the Buddhist denial of God is not that saying God does not exist. They're saying they're saying God is God is so far infinitely beyond uh, description. In other words, it's radical apophaticism. Well, that's actually true. Yeah, God is so infinitely beyond our ability to uh, describe Him that um, uh, how can we say that he exists because how God exists is, is utterly alien to how we exist. 
as St. Gregory says, of, not, of, of Nisa. He said, if God exists, we don't. And if we exist, God doesn't. And what they're missing, of course, is the person of Christ. And right, that's the, exactly. That's the answer to the question they, they can't answer. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, and, but God, can, God can give spiritual awareness to whoever he wills. That's, that's his business. It's not our business. And it's not our business to say that he can. He, it's certainly not our business to say what God can and can't do. Yeah. So if I remember correctly, I think you said you know that you are engaging the noetic aspect of the prayer if you understand that it's sort of a shared effect. Well, you're you're engaging the noet you're you're engaging noetic awareness. Um and noetic awareness is prayer. Um, you're engaging noetic awareness when you when you have that a deep knowledge that God is present. When you're aware of His presence, or you're aware of holiness. So my question is, uh, what what is actually going on spiritually when uh, charismatic? Well, we can't we can't really say because we're not charismatic evangelicals. Um, but you can say, I think we can say that um, just as uh, contemplative prayer is nonverbal prayer, non conceptual prayer, so also is speaking in tongues. It's non conceptual prayer. But it could also just be a combination of the soul and the yeah. flesh too. Yeah, it could be. It could be this. Could possibly be this. I don't know. It could be demonic, and because the, one of the the major thing that's missing in uh, in those charismatic circles is uh, discernment. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a and that's a very serious issue. But there, but there are some remarkably uh, mature, spiritually mature people in in some of those movements, and um, uh, so we don't, you know, we don't have to hate everyone who's not Orthodox. And that's absurd, and it's and it's and it's contrary to Christianity. It's contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't hate anybody. We can disagree. That's fine. So, um, so the reason for to pursue the higher levels of prayer is to attain to that transformation of soul. And that transformation of soul comes first. First, there's the, uh, uh, the, the purgative stage the, um, in which we're um, uh, in purgation, illumination, deification, in which we, you know, in which we get rid of our sins, we get rid of our... Um, uh, of our resentments, we get rid of all of the all of the stuff that has been all of the uh, motion emotions, memories, all of the stuff that we've stuffed over the years, all of the uh, all of the conflict, all of the all of all of the stuff that ultimately um, is unpleasant, <laughs> you know. Um, and 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 we we purge we purge it out of ourselves. How? By going to confession, by renouncing it, by letting go of it, and letting the grace of the Holy Spirit come and cleanse our soul. Right. That's the basic process. Um, but those two phases of uh, spiritual action. Um, the purgation and the and the illumination, because what what God cleanses and 
and heals, he also illumines. So I like to use the, the analogy of, a, of, um, of, of the garage of a hoarder. If you can imagine the kind of horror that is um, of somebody who has so much stuff that, you know, the garage is so packed that you can turn the light on and you never know the difference. <laughs> right? <laughs> I've seen places like that. I haven't been in a place like that. And <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> uh, you need more stuff. Yeah, you need more stuff. Um, but uh, so how do you how do, how do you deal with that? Well, you, where do you where do you start first? Wherever you can, right? I mean, if you can't if you, if you can't move, if you can't move past the door, you just pull get rid of the stuff that's closest to the door, and so you pull it away, pull it out, and pull it out, and pull it out, and pull it out, you know, and pile it, and then pile it on the sidewalk, and hopefully the uh, the, the garbage truck will come by and take most of it, right? Um, and then what does that do? It opens up some space and you can see more of what needs to get dealt with, right? And so, and so you pull it out and pull it out and pull it out and pull it out and so you have another full dump truck load and you put it on the curb and get rid of it and you confess it and, um, and, and it's gone. And, and so a little more light shines into the darkness, right? which just illumines more stuff that you need to do. And so on and on and on, this process repeats itself until you have a clean garage and you can, and you can flip open the switch, flip on the switch and you can see walls and a floor. Miracle of miracles. And so, and so it, it's the same, the same way with our soul. It's this process of, uh, and this is the beginning of that process of transformation. Because think about it, you're going to be a different person once, you, once you've gotten rid of all of that painful material that, you, that you've been holding on to for decades, right? And by which you've come to define yourself. Um, and, so, and so that, in, and in other words, you've been illumined been illumined because the grace of the Holy Spirit now has a place to, to rest within your soul and you and you can see anything that still needs to get dealt with just like that garage once it's empty you can you can see you can turn the light on and you can see that now it's clean um, so, so, so the, pur the purgation, the illumination, both of these are phases of deification. Or in case you'd rather have the Greek word. The Greek, the Greek word. word. <laughs> it's always better. <laughs> okay. The Greek word. <clears throat> I think that's right. Should be. Um. Because, because what's going on spiritually? You get if if you finally repent and let go of all of your sins, and you let go of all of these attachments to things that you have been holding on to, and that have allowed you to and by which you have had defined yourself, and then you let go of them, you're transformed. And instead of being defined by I'm a victim of this, and I'm a victim of that, and I, um, and I own this. In other words, instead of being defined by our ego, which and its attachments, we can be we can be defined by the true person of the heart. Which is our true self anyway. 
because all of those attachments, all the resentments, they distort our ego. They distort our concept of ourself. And so once that con once once we've gotten rid of all of those attachments, those sinful attachments to people, to relationships, to things, to um, uh, to our self concept, to our self hatred, to our self, to our toxic shame, to our um, uh, arrogance, to our all of the all of these things, to our passions. Um, so we've gotten rid of those. We can't define ourselves by our passions any longer because they're under control. Dispassion. Dispassion. Apathia. We can't define ourselves any longer by our um, uh, I don't know, attachment to, to certain well, think think about think about high school. Can't you can't define yourself? Hopefully, by the time you're 18, as a goth or as a. a I don't even know what they are. What the, I don't I don't even know what the youth movements are now. But you know what I mean, right? A hipster. A, a hipster or a. It all passes away, right? And you can and, and you free and you can and you can let it go because it's not really who you are. And so the true person emerges. Well, this and noetic prayer, while we might have while we'll have glimpses of it, while, while we might have little little bits and pieces of it, in its fullness, it can't happen until we get rid of all of that crap. Until we get rid of all of all of these things, all of these sinful things that distort our self-concept, which is what our ego is. But then once we've gotten rid of it, then the soul can begin to act as it was created to be. Where the noetic faculty is in charge and is the dominant factor in our consciousness. In other words, where the, where the presence of God is the dominant element of our consciousness. And our whole life becomes directed towards the restoration or towards the integration of our entire life and consciousness by that awareness of God. So that what what does what does the what does the person who has repented look like? Adam and Eve in paradise. It's the restoration to paradise. It's the restoration of the state of Adam before the fall. As far as possible in this fallen world. And that's pretty awesome. And that's who the saints are. The great elders, that's what happened to them. Um, because they're the people who are the most profoundly spiritually immature. The ones that I've known have gotten there through intense suffering. Because what it's done is it's purified them. Purgation and purification are the same thing. It purified them 
They came to see the absolute vanity of all of the all of the aspects of of egocentric life. Um, Elder Kirill of most blessed memory um, in Russia. He was he was a he was a Soviet war hero. He held back a, a battalion of Nazi soldiers for weeks by himself from an entire segment of uh, the city of Stalingrad. And every Soviet kid heard his name in the in school, learned his name in school. They learned his secular name. But of course, they didn't know that he went off and joined the monastery immediately after the end of the Second World War. Um, what about Elder Ephraim? Elder Ephraim, he he lived under under Elder Joseph, which was who the Hesychast. Elder Joseph the Hesychast never said a kind word to him. <laughs> he berated him. He called him names. He he swore at him. He uh, he was he was brutal. He was absolutely brutal to Elder Ephraim. Um, through suffering, and it took that to break his ego. Now, we don't exactly do that too much, do we? Let's not. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> not, not, not enough, right? Um, but, you know, people, you know, but that's what, that's what they went through. But that was, a, that was the way that they were purified. You know, there's purification by suffering, and quite frankly, in this in this business, that's um, that's the way most people are pu are purified by suffering. Um, I, Bishop Basil, mm -hmm. you know, he suffered in the Gulag. Tito's Gulag, who was tortured for two years. Um, and that became the foundation of his spiritual life. How many, how many others? I mean, Elder George, Father George Calcio. Somebody sent me a picture of Father George Calcio at St. Herman's um, when it was still Christ the Savior, when it was just getting started. Hmm. And 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 so, uh, so the, this community had the blessing of such a great elder and confessor. And confessor. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so does this all make sense? Okay. Questions? Yeah. So oftentimes you'll see a transformation of somebody uh, with an intense military training mm -hmm. from being, let's say, uh, derelict mm -hmm. to a good, orderly, rounded person. Do you think that's because of the breaking of the ego during the military training? Um, that's when it works. That when it works, I've also seen the opposite. Uh, I've also experienced the opposite. But yeah, uh, which uh, that's pretty depends horrible. Yeah, depends on the person. Yeah, depends on the person. Yeah. Okay, so as someone who has obviously not you know, been tortured in a gulag, yet are there <laughs> are there voluntary forms of let's uh, I guess spiritual struggle or suffering that should be sought out, or rather, should we just sort of be trusting that if we're living an orthodox life, God will send us through circumstance purifying sufferings and trials. God will send you what you need. That's his providence. Um, it's not very pleasant, but um, it, but you, but you do get what you need to work out your salvation. Well, should the opposite be a concern? That if your life is too easy and you don't have that, that somehow God is forsaken you? Well, that's that's what a lot of the well, it's, that's what the, they say in the Desert Fathers. Yeah. You know, this monk where everything was going well and he had plenty. You know, I had plenty of supplies and everything was good and 
And he said, oh, God is, and, yeah, and he wasn't sick. And he said, God has forsaken me. Yeah, well, isn't that a concern? If you have a marshmallow life, maybe God's given up on you. Yeah. Well, I have yet to see a marshmallow life. It's all relevant, I guess. Yeah. A lot of people have easy lives. Yeah. So. But anyway, I mean, but this is this, of course, is what monastic life is about. But it's but it's also what what simple basic Christian life is about. There's no difference between the path of salvation in the monastery and in, and in the and in the, and in the world. Well, somebody's pointed out that the great flowering monasticism began when Christianity became legal because you no longer had red martyrdom, you had green martyrdom instead in a monastic life. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, all right. So, shall we pray?